Welcome back, everyone. The Muslim world has concocted some enormous lies about the Quran. Do you remember that scientific miracles thing? The scientific miracles argument in the Quran got debunked. Yeah, I hope my tajweed was on point. Another extraordinarily popular Quran lie was about its miraculous preservation. Yeah, that narrative also went down like the Hindenburg. Here's another one you're familiar with. The very nature of the revelation to Muhammad is itself miraculous. You see, Muhammad was illiterate, yet he could receive and recite the Quran. This argument has always been a non sequitur for me because illiterate people can still hear and repeat stuff. But whatever. For an example of undeniable proof that Muhammad was illiterate, here's Surah 7157, which talks about those who follow the messenger, the prophet of the common people, the Umi, whom they find written in their Torah and Gospel. And verse 158 also mentions the prophet of the common people. Other translations refer to the unlettered prophet and others, more explicitly, the prophet who can neither read nor write. And now for some obligatory YouTube video examples. Was the prophet illiterate? And the answer is yes, definitely. It's a consensus of scholars that the Prophet ﷺ did not know how to read nor write. The Quran states, first and foremost, in chapter 62, verse 2, right? Allah says, mm -hmm. yeah? uh, So he's the one who sent from among the illiterate ones a prophet from them. And it's mentioned in chapter number 29 of the Quran that you don't write it with your right hand. Mm. Then, if you had, then the mubtilun, the detractors, would be in doubt. So these are two clear verses in the Quran. But why is Muhammad's illiteracy so important? Well, get ready for this monster quote from the study Quran. Here we go. Might need some voices droning in the background for this one. The description of the Prophet as unlettered is traditionally understood to mean that he was unable to read and write. That's according to Al-Tabari, a fact that is affirmed in various ways in the Sirah or biographical literature concerning him. That the Prophet was unable to read and write serves in Islamic tradition as a fundamental proof of the miraculous nature of the Quran and the purity of the soul of the Prophet, who was the recipient of it that's referencing Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, and of its divine provenance, since it would be otherwise impossible for a man who had not studied earlier works to produce eloquent verses containing knowledge of past peoples and prophets. That the prophet was unlettered is understood to mean that his soul was not defiled by profane knowledge, and that it was a clean slate upon which the divine word could be inscribed in its purest form, untainted by humanly acquired knowledge and learning. A variation of these is also the apologetic argument that's required since the Quran clearly borrows from numerous pre-Islamic sources. As the argument goes, if Muhammad was illiterate, then he couldn't have read those other sources and reproduced them to some extent in the Quran. Furthermore, one historical fact that the Prophet was illiterate is sufficient to dispel all these theories that he copied from somewhere else. Again, another terrible argument since illiterate people can still hear and repeat stuff. I'm not sure what's worse, arguments that bad or lies, but Muslims have given us plenty of both in their narratives about their sacred scripture. And the illiteracy narrative, like the rest, has taken its share of scholarly beatings. Here are some recent examples. In a 2002 article in the Journal of Quranic Studies, Sebastian Gunter conducted a thorough study and concluded that the philological historical examination of the three Quranic terms Umi, Umiyun, and Umma does not confirm the popular interpretation of Umi, which focuses exclusively on illiteracy. Rather, this interpretation seems to reflect a post-Quranic approach that evolved in circles of Muslim learning, possibly not before the first half of the second or eighth century. And that has been shaped further under the influence of Muslim theologians and apologists. And it's not uncommon in scholarly literature to run across statements like these. On the lack of early Quran manuscripts, Amir Muezi and Kohlberg casually comment, no autographed manuscript exists from the hand of Muhammad. And a parenthetical aside, it is now well known that he was not illiterate. Could it be so well known that yet another miraculous Muslim narrative is false? Well, this narrative has taken yet another blow in scholarship by Nikolai Sinai's recent lexicon called Key Terms of the Quran. He notes that in Surah 3, Umi is used in opposition to people who already have the scriptures. The Umi are people, therefore, who do not yet have scripture. 
So verse 20 of Surah 3 reads in part, And say to those who have been given the book, and to the common people. Likewise, verse 75 contrasts the people of the book with the common people. And in Surah 2, Sinai observes that the Umiyun are effectively glossed as those who do not know the scripture. The Quran therefore seems to define the word quite clearly for us. In Surah 62, Sinai observes that the same definition is plausible as well. A messenger was raised up from among people who did not yet possess the scriptures. And regarding the passage in Surah 7 that we read earlier, he comments, When these verses call Muhammad the Umi prophet, then this is not a comment on his educational attainment. Rather, the passage underscores, in line with Surah 62, 2-3, that Muhammad's mission marks the expansion of scriptural prophecy beyond the narrow confines of the Ahl al-Khattab, the scripture owners, consisting in the Israelites and the Christians. Sinai acknowledges that some will cite Surah 29. You were not accustomed to read from any book, Kitab, before it, or to write it with your right hand, for then the perpetrators of falsehood would indeed have had reason to doubt you. Of course, even English translations betray a glaring problem you will notice by now. The verse does not contain the Arabic word umi, which is the word Muslims want to define as illiterate. Additionally, Sinai notes, it is evident that Surah 2948 does not employ the noun kitab in the general sense of a piece of writing, but rather in a more specific meaning, scripture, which is undoubtedly what the word signifies in the immediately preceding verses, 45 through 47. Accordingly, the point of 2948 is to insist that prior to the beginning of God's revelations to him, the Quranic messenger did not have access to scriptural revelations, leaving him unable to recite or transcribe them. And related to this verse, Sinai also cites 25.5, where the supposedly illiterate messenger is accused of writing down old tales, an odd accusation, if the Quran's messenger, taken to be Muhammad, was illiterate. Sinai concludes the dispute that may be glimpsed via 25.5 and 29.48, therefore, seems to have been about whether Muhammad's preaching was based on genuine revelation or merely on some form of readerly access to existing religious writings, whether mediated by external assistance or not. He also rejects translating Umi as Gentile, as some have suggested, arguing that a preferable translation is the prophet of those not hitherto endowed with scripture or the prophet of of the scripturalists. Finally, let's get back to Surah 29 for a bit of a twist. He says, It is entirely plausible to understand 2948 to be implying that while Muhammad did not previously recite any scripture nor write it down, God's conveyance of the scripture to him has now enabled him to do both. That is, just as Muhammad is now patently understood to be engaged in reciting, so he is now also understood to be engaged in transcribing the scriptural revelations granted to him. Thus construed, the verse presumes that in the wake of God's revelatory address, the Quranic messenger is displaying at least a basic level of literacy. In sum, 2948 is at best immaterial to the question of Muhammad's illiteracy, but could well be adduced in favor of his literacy. Does this verse indicate Muhammad's literacy against the Muslim narrative? Well, if so, it coheres nicely with the accusations of Surah 25, which assume the literacy of the Quran's messenger. This would also cohere with Muhammad's supposed background and trade, as well as with several hadith that indicate his literacy, though, of course, there are hadith that support the narrative, since that's mostly what they do anyway. Now get ready for some egregious stupidity. Muslim apologists will argue for Muhammad's illiteracy and then use that to argue that he's prophesied in the Bible. From Isaiah 29, for you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say, read this, please, they will answer, I can't, it's sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, read this, please, they'll answer, I don't know how to read. This is where Muslim apologists ironically prove their own illiteracy as some of the most incompetent pseudo-Bible readers to ever walk the face of the earth. These verses are clearly saying that Isaiah's vision is for everyone, but it's become sealed to the people because of their own stubbornness. The people Isaiah is addressing because of their rebellion against God can always find a reason not to heed Isaiah's words. This is a frequent theme in Isaiah from earlier in that chapter. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. Or from a few chapters earlier, he said, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. 
such verses are appropriate for the legacy of Muslim biblical pseudo-interpretation. With that background, let's return to the astonishing prophecy of the illiterate Muhammad in Isaiah 29. Gary Smith comments, The emphasis in the illustration should not be put on people's lack of education or inability to sound out Hebrew letters. Hear that, Muslim apologists? But on their inability to read prophecies with understanding and appreciation. Oswald concludes that these scribes had the technical ability to understand God's word, but they lacked the spiritual insight which would enable them to see the plain meaning. In Paul Wigner's commentary, he also states the obvious meaning of the text, plain for all to see except for Muslim apologists. Even though this oracle was offered to everyone, they all found an excuse not to read and obey it. These verses are a condemnation. They aren't a place you want to find your prophet mentioned in the Bible, Muslim. So when the illiteracy argument collapses, a lot more falls with it. The already unmiraculous Quran becomes much more unmiraculous. The extremely weak defense about Muhammad borrowing from pre-Islamic sources, yeah, it collapses. Oh yes, Muhammad wasn't such a blank slate after all. And yet another prophecy of Muhammad in the Bible is exposed for multiple reasons, as an embarrassment to the ridiculous endeavor of Muslim apologetics. Questions for Muslims. Do you ever get tired of your own apologists? Why are so many narratives about your most sacred book propped up by lies? Where do the lies stop? Have we found them all? Or are there more lies to uncover? Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.